All right. Hey, come on in, everyone. Here we are. It's Ministry to Muslims. I'm Eric, and we are going to explore the world of Islam in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have uh, uh, part two of a series we started last month. Before we get to uh, what our teaching topic is, though, I want to make sure you know this coming Saturday, March 23rd, is going to be a debate on this channel. Owen Giles is going to square off with Nadir Ahmed, and the topic is, Is Jesus God? So we're look, looking forward to that. That'll be 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time. All right, so keep that on your calendar. All right, and so today it's, it's uh, Reverend Anthony Rogers. There he is. Hey, Anthony, I don't want to take away too much from your teaching time, but... um. Why don't you just maybe share a minute or two of how you got into studying Islam and uh, challenging the uh, Islamic uh, narrative? Yeah, so I was converted at 18 years old after engaging in all sorts of sins and criminal activity. And when the Lord forgave me, I was overwhelmed. I thought this is incredible and needs to be declared to everyone, I assumed they would quickly embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, finding in him the solution to their sin and guilt, and found out quickly that was not the case. Many people considered what is good news to be bad news, because instead of hearing the promise of forgiveness, they heard they're sinners and stand guilty before a holy God and are liable to judgment. And so instead of accepting Christ, they would lash out and raise all sorts of objections. So I quickly learned that evangelism also needs apologetics. You need to be able to defend the faith that you're proclaiming to them. And more than that, it sometimes involves polemics. It is not only the case that we're defending the truth of Christianity, but we're opposing certain other views, such as Islam. And so in this early context, I started to run into a lot of different groups, including Muslims. In fact, early on, it was more often than not the nation of Islam that I was encountering. And I started learning something about Islam in order to at least raise a problem for them in, in light of the fact that their version of Islam is not even authentic Islam. And so learning something about historical Islam was for me a tool to say, look, you guys aren't even holding to that. And so uh, this thing that you're holding to is not even the, the authentic thing. So uh, also I learned that mainstream Sunni Muslims were using a lot of Jehovah's Witness material and I was engaging a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses and so I, I found on the answeringislam.org website articles written in response to Muslims that were at the same time dealing with certain Jehovah's Witness objections. And I found them useful for that reason. And so when I eventually started coming into more and more contact with Sunni Muslims, I learned that I had more information about Islam than I even realized because it was inadvertent. I wasn't necessarily focusing on the Islamic material for the sake of Muslims, but for the sake of these other groups that were uh, a source for them, you know, their anti-Christian material. And then I started writing material. It was picked up by Jochen Cates, who's the administrator of answeringislam.org. That eventually brought me into the purview of David Wood. So David and I started doing things together back when Nabil was still alive. We wrote stuff on the blog, answeringmuslims.com. We started doing events. Eventually, he introduced me to George of Ministry to Muslims. And George eventually started bringing me out for debates and uh, speaking at conferences. And so here we are, uh, many, many years later. I don't even know how long it's been, 15 to 20 years or so. I haven't kept track. Praise God. Yeah, and so um, I think... Around 50 years ago, the numbers I looked at, uh, the number of Muslims, it, it's increased something like eightfold to now. And so mm. those of you out there, if you are um, 
the, the least bit interested in studying about Islam, we need you to um, continue, you know, that effort. And of course, as God leads, but we uh, need um, uh, just as many as we can get to, because so many Christians just don't want to do this ministry, but we're thankful for people like Anthony. All right. So with that, uh, we're continuing, and this is part two, I think, of the sins of the prophets. Yes, yes. So uh, if you're ready, we'll just give you the floor. All right. Thank you. All right. So quick summary from last time. I started looking at this question, one, because it's it's something that comes up a lot has a lot of different points of application to discussions between Christians and Muslims, but also because I was reading some new material I hadn't seen before, and it reminded me of this whole area, and I thought this is a really good thing to look into some more and equip Christians with, but uh, it has to do with the issue of the sins of the prophets. If you've engaged Muslims, you've probably heard as an objection to the reliability of the Bible as it currently exists, you've probably heard the objection that the Bible can't be reliable because, after all, it records certain sins committed by the prophets. It mentions the sin of Noah in Genesis chapter 9 after they disembarked after the flood. Noah imbibes too much from the fruit of the vine and uh, becomes drunk. And uh, not only Noah, but you have the example of Abraham lying on a number of occasions to the Pharaoh or uh, the king, King Abimelech. A number of individuals in the Old Testament are said to have sinned. And Muslims will object then to the Bible and say it can't be what was originally given since the prophets can't sin. Now, when I first heard this from a Muslim, I was genuinely surprised because I had read the Quran and up to that point had read numerous ahadith from the various Sunni collections, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Jamiat Turmidi, and so forth. And all throughout that material, it records the sins of people that came whom Muslims identify as prophets. And uh, so I thought to myself, what's what's going on here? Have I seriously misread this material? Uh, what is it that accounts for why Muslims adamantly insist upon the claim that the prophets are sinless? Well, over time, as I continue to study this issue further, it became apparent one of the main driving forces behind this idea is the fact that the Quran and the Hadith are very clear, stridently clear on the fact that Jesus never sinned. So the one thing we can say that the Quranic, uh, the Quran and the Hadith say, and that Islamic orthodoxy teaches is that Jesus never sinned. For example, in various traditions, we're told that every child of Adam is touched by Satan at, at its birth. And there's some other sordid stuff that goes along with that that I won't get into, but every child is touched by Satan upon their birth, with the exception of Mary and her child. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that Mary never sinned, but at least this much is true that neither her nor her child were touched by Satan at their conception and birth. Later in the Quran, in its account of Christ's life, it refers to Jesus as pure and also as blessed. And one of the things that's interesting here is the fact that uh, the Islamic sources might refer to other things as blessed, but they don't refer to any person as blessed. 
So Jesus wasn't touched by Satan. Jesus was pure. Jesus was blessed. And we have explicit statements, one of which I'll read in a bit, that Jesus never sinned. So this is a point of embarrassment for Muslims. And it's not the only point of embarrassment. In addition to the, the teachings of the Islamic sources that Jesus never sinned, are the teachings in those same sources that Jesus performed mighty miracles. To be sure, the Quran says that he did this by the leave of Allah, that is, by Allah's permission, but there's no statement in the Islamic sources that Allah gave Jesus the power or the ability to do these things. Power and authority, while related to each other, aren't the same thing. If I tell my child, I used this illustration last time, that he can go across the street to the neighbor's house, I'm giving him permission to do that, but the ability is something that he has inherently. And the Islamic sources never speak of Jesus having some power given to him in order to do these things. Besides that, a number of the things Jesus does are distinctive to God, and Muhammad upbraided the pagans for ascribing such works to their would-be deities. And so even if the, the, the pagans thought that Allah was the ultimate God and gave power and ability to these other deities, Muhammad objected to this as shirk, as associating partners with Allah, as polytheism. And so if the Quran turns around and says Jesus can do these things, and it's Allah who gives him the power, which it doesn't say, but if, if that's the excuse, it's still a problem because that's shirk by Islamic standards. Well, in any case, it vexes Muslims to see at every turn, whenever it's talking about Jesus, Jesus performing mighty miracles, bringing clay birds to life, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind. In, in the Gospels, Jesus is not only described as giving sight to the blind, but even eyes. There's the case of the blind man who didn't even have eyes that Jesus restores. And, of course, life and, and a number, number of other things. This is a, a serious problem to Muslims in light of their belief that Muhammad was the last and the best of all the prophets. How can it be that Jesus performed miracles and our prophet didn't? And so eventually, even though the Islamic sources don't ascribe any miracle to Muhammad, eventually later sources begin to add this. These are accretions in the Islamic narrative. They began to ascribe things to Muhammad in order to make him more like Jesus. And, and so the same thing is at work when it comes to this idea of the prophets being without sin. It begins with the idea that Muhammad was sinless in order to make Muhammad out to be better than Jesus. You, you can't have him better than Jesus if he's not doing at least the things that Jesus did that show his superiority over others. And this eventually works its way out into what they think about all the other prophets, because along with this, they also claimed that Muhammad had to be sinless in order to be a reliable witness to the revelation of God. If Muhammad was a sinner and he's purveying Allah's message, then how can we trust this message if this man that's purveying it to us is himself a sinner? And if that's true in the case of Muhammad, then it would have to be true of others. And so this is how the myth of the sinless prophets was born in Islam. Now, the, the problem with this is, of course, what I said at the beginning. The Quran and the various traditions are not silent. They, they speak ever and anon of the fact that the prophets sinned. I started last week by looking at Adam, and I want to kind of wrap that up today. But as a as a reminder, uh, one of the things that I pointed out: to, Muslims are uh, famous for moving the goalposts, and so whereas there is a pretty common idea among all the scholars of Islam on what they mean by the sinlessness of the prophets you often get rank and file Muslims changing things around in order to account for 
what we actually have in the sources. And so he, here's the official claim. The official claim is that Muhammad himself never committed any sin, major or minor, before or after he became a prophet. In the case of other prophets, the idea is that none of them ever committed any major sin before or after their prophethood, whereas it might have been the case that some of them committed a minor sin before their prophethood. Some others, thinking that goes a bit too far, will say that, well, some of them could have committed minor sins after their prophethood, but, at le but here they at least insist no major sins since the time of their prophethood. Others will say that what could be attributed to the prophets are simply mistakes or errors, not moral lapses, but simply uh, misinformed choices, uh, poor uh, exercise of wisdom, something like that. So, so that's the, the basic claim. But we started looking at Adam last time, and we saw that he's a major problem for Muslims. Because even though as Christians, we're not accustomed to referring to Adam as a prophet, Muslims think that every figure virtually that is mentioned in the Quran from the Bible was a prophet. So Adam was a prophet. Noah was a prophet. Abraham was a prophet. Isaac was a prophet. Ishmael was a prophet. Whoever gets renamed in the Quran almost without exception, if they're if they're one of the good guys, then they're reputed to have been a prophet. So what do they do then? This is the issue I raised with the fact that Adam, even according to the Islamic sources, sinned in paradise and was kicked out, causing all of his future descendants to be born into a very different context than the one in which Adam was originally situated. Adam originally enjoyed a paradise made by God and all the pleasures and joys and everything else that comes with it. And none of us do. And that's all because of what Adam did. Now, in the Bible, of course, this has a very clear theological explication, right? In Romans 5, for example, the apostle Paul says, through one man's sin, uh, death entered the world. Uh, in, in Genesis, it, it talks about the curse. God uh, subjects everything to his curse, which uh, also uh, joined with that is this idea of inborn corruption, so that when you look at Adam's descendants, they all have this uh, sinful nature that's on full display. Immediately, we have the account of Cain and Abel, where Cain slays his brother. Uh, we have the evidence of the fact that both of them are sinners, not just Cain, but also Abel, because they're bringing sacrifices. Abel's sacrifice is accepted because he brings not only the fruit of the ground, but also the firstborn of his flock, showing that he needs a blood sacrifice. All this points up the fact that man, after and as a consequence, of Adam's fall became guilty before God and also corrupt, prone to sin and in need of atonement and forgiveness. Well, Muslims aren't comfortable with a lot of that, but the fact of the matter is, and it's inescapable, according to the Quran, Surah 2, Surah 7, Adam sinned, and as a result of his sin, he was banished from the garden, and all of us are, as a consequence, born outside of the garden. Well, one response to this, and I think this is where I left it last time, one, one response to this that Muslims will often give is that Adam's sin was not that serious. Adam's sin was, was a minor thing. He partook of the fruit. Well, already we, we have to know this is far from adequate. Adam was banished from paradise. And according to Islamic tradition, even though I don't think that the Quran is very consistent here, there are some problems, but glossing over that, Adam was in paradise, which is conceived of as existing in heaven. And so when Adam sinned, he loses this lofty 
prerogative, this lofty condition. He's banished from a heavenly existence to an earthly one. He's kicked out of heaven and sent down to the earth. So this already shows us that there's a enormity to this sin. It wasn't the, the the minor peccadillo that some Muslims, to safeguard to some degree the idea of the prophets being sinless, uh, it, it isn't the minor peccadillo they want to make it out to be. But another response, which actually does a little bit better of a job here, even if it's not finally successful, is the claim that Adam was not yet a prophet. So already, though, you can see they're they're attenuating things. On the one hand, the claim is that prophets don't commit any major or minor sin before or after their prophethood. In the case of Adam, they have to start shifting grounds here a bit, moving the goalposts, because Adam did sin, so they'll say it was a minor sin. Okay, minor sins can be committed by prophets before their prophethood. However, as I just showed, the sin of Adam was clearly a major sin, so that too has to go. Major sins could be committed by the prophets even before their prophethood. Uh, but what about this idea that it was before his prophethood? Well, there are a number of problems here, and there's there's actually a, a quicker and easier route to go than, than what I'm about to point out. But uh, just for the sake of comprehensiveness, I, I do want to point it out. Uh, according to the Islamic sources, one of the things that's involved in fact, it's the, the central thing that constitutes one a prophet is that this person receives revelation from Allah, and he in turn becomes the source of that knowledge to others. Now, this is an unobjectionable definition of prophethood. When we think biblically, what is a prophet? In fact, uh, there are three anointed offices in the Israelite economy, that of prophet, priest, and king. The priest is someone who represents man before God. So the priest offers sacrifices and intercedes with God on the basis of those sacrifices. The prophet, in distinction from the priest, represents God to people. So both of these are mediators or go-betweens. Under the Old Covenant, of course, they are typical of the one true mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're go-betweens. So in the case of the priest, their direction of mediation is Godward. In the case of prophets, it's manward. The prophets speak from God to man. But when we look at the sources of Adam, his creation, and his fall, it's evident that he received revelation from Allah and pervade that knowledge even prior to his alleged fall. If you look, for example, at Surah 2, it mentions Allah creating Adam. It says, it is he who created for you everything on earth and then turned to the heaven and made the, the seven heavens and he's aware of all things. Then it says, when your Lord said to the angels, I am placing a successor on earth, it's referring to Adam, they said, will you place in it someone who will cause corruption in it and shed blood while we declare your praises and sanctify you? He said, I know what you do not know. And he taught Adam the names. Notice this. He teaches Adam the names. And the idea here is not just that he gives Adam sounds to use for creatures. The idea is that he's being given an insight into the, the nature of these, these animals and and that by means of words that convey this. So, I mean, that's the idea. Certainly in Genesis, there's, there's no point if all Adam is doing is just coming up with sounds to refer to them, uh, that, that just misses the point of what's going on in Genesis. The whole idea is that Adam, as he was originally made and, and placed over all creation, is by virtue of being God's image bearer and his vice regent and having dominion over everything, he perceives their true nature and he, he gives them names that are appropriate to their natures. And that's why names are so significant throughout the Bible. Often a name corresponds to something that's true about the person, either their ancestry, their, uh, their personal character, some great feat that they will per perform. Names are significant in the Bible and they're, they're not just ways of 
referring to someone. So Allah taught Adam the names, all of them. Then he presented them to the angels and said, tell me the names of these if you're sincere. So notice the angels, because they aren't given this knowledge from Allah, aren't able to accurately name the animals as Adam did. And then they say, the angels, glory be to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. It is you who are the knowledgeable, the wise. So Adam was a recipient of, he was taught by Allah, who is the knowledgeable, the wise. So Adam was clearly a recipient of divine knowledge. And it was through him that this knowledge was made known to the angels. And by the way, in the Islamic conception, Prophets are prophets not only to uh, people, but to the jinn and to angels. So knowledge of God comes through the prophets even to them. While angels might be privy to certain information that human beings aren't, it's also the case that human beings are privy to things that other beings aren't, not just men. But then in verse 33 of Surah 2, it says, he said, oh, Adam, tell them their names. And when he told them their names, he said, did I not tell you that I know the secrets of the heavens and the earth and that I know what you reveal and what you conceal? So here's Adam by means of Allah opening or disclosing what was hidden, what was otherwise unknown. This is the very definition, the essence of prophethood. Then notice what it says. And we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. They bowed down except for Satan. He refused. He was arrogant. He was one of the disbelievers. So after Adam gets this knowledge, he makes it known to the angels. The angels are commanded to bow down. Satan refuses. Then notice what happens after that. We said, oh, Adam, inhabit the garden, which is in paradise, you and your spouse, and eat from it freely as you please, but do not approach this tree lest you become wrongdoers. So notice the order. Adam is clearly a recipient of revelation, clearly a prophet. He demonstrates his knowledge from Allah to the angels. The angels are commanded to bow down to him. Then he's placed in the garden. And after this, it talks about how Satan deceives or uh, gets them to go out of the way. Adam sins. He's kicked out of the garden. So the, the point that I'm making here is the logic of this story, the, the chronology of it, is that Adam was a prophet when he committed this enormity that got him banished and all of his descendants banished from paradise. So it, it's simply not a, a, a way of escape from our objection against their claim that the prophets were sinless to say that Adam didn't commit a major sin. Neither is it a, a escape to say that Adam did this sin before he became a prophet. Clearly, he was a prophet. In fact, there's a hadith in Jamiat Termidi. This is Jamiat Termidi 3609. It says, narrated Abu Huraira. They said, O messenger of Allah, when was the prophethood established for you? He said, well, Adam was between being soul and body. So prophethood, understand there, there's a logic here. It's talking about Muhammad here, but it's saying that his prophethood was established all the way back then, which means it was already established for Adam. And so in Islamic thinking, this is part of the reason why Muhammad couldn't have even sinned before he became a prophet, because there simply was no time when he wasn't a prophet. The descendants of Adam were taken out of his loins before they were actually birthed. This is when Adam. Allah first made man, according to Surah 7. He took out all their descendants. They were made to confess him as the true God. And even at that time, we're told that the people were able to recognize those who were prophets. So these people are already indelibly marked by Allah as prophets before they're ever born. And, and if, uh, if Muhammad is constituted a prophet before his birth, then and he's the culmination of prophethood, which begins with Adam, then the same thing would be true of Adam. But in any case, the logic of this in the Islamic sources, I think, is pretty clear. But but there's another thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a hadith in which Adam and Moses are arguing with each other. We're told that Muhammad, this is in Sahih Bukhari, uh, volume 8, book 77, number 611, it says, the prophet said, Adam and Moses argued with each other. So this is obviously in 
paradise after both had died, Moses said to Adam, oh, Adam, you are our father who disappointed us and turned us out of paradise. Then Adam said to him, oh, Moses, Allah favored you with his talk, and he wrote for you the Torah with his own hand. So before going on in this hadith, uh, what's going on here, the idea is that Moses is rebuking Adam. He's sore with Adam because it was his fault that everybody got kicked out of paradise. So he says to Adam, aren't you that Adam that got us all kicked out of paradise? You disappointed us all. And Adam says to Moses, Allah gave you his speech. He favored you with it. And then he says, do you blame me for an action which Allah had written in my fate 40 years before my creation? So the idea is you had the Torah, which talked about my sin. And that Torah that was given to you had been written 40 years prior to my creation. So it was already written for me. How can you blame me for this? Now, I don't think the logic here holds. Just because something's ordained doesn't mean somebody's absolved of guilt. The Bible certainly doesn't do that. In the case of the crucifixion of Christ, we're told that it happened according to the predeterminate plan and foreknowledge of God explicitly in Acts 2 and Acts 4. And yet Peter and the apostles upbraid the lawless men for delivering Jesus over to death. In Genesis 50, Joseph says of his brothers, they meant what they did to him for evil, but God meant it for good. So God can order something in such a way that he's bringing about an ultimate good, even if he's using sinful men and their sinful actions to accomplish it. God can strike a straight blow with a crooked stick. So I don't agree with the logic here, but, but notice the point. Adam is identifying Moses as a prophet by virtue of the fact that Allah favored him with his talk, his speech. Allah spoke to him and gave him the Torah. Clearly, this is the commencement of Muhammad's prophethood, or excuse me, Moses' prophethood. But if this is the commencement of Moses' prophethood, when he's given Allah's speech and Allah gives him the Torah, well, then Allah's speech to Adam would also indicate the commencement of Adam's prophethood. So again, we have a disproof, a disconfirmation of the idea that Adam wasn't a prophet until after he sinned. No, clearly he was a recipient of revelation and a communicator of it prior to his fall. But there's a third objection or a response, which really misses everything, but it's still given by Muslims. What they will say is that Adam was forgiven. Adam was forgiven. And apparently the assumption is he didn't sin from that time forward. Now, this is presumptuous. There's no statement in the Islamic sources that say Adam didn't sin after this act of forgiveness. And uh, given that the Quran never teaches this whole doctrine of sinlessness anyways, there's just no reason, there's no momentum behind this idea that suddenly Adam would have remained sinless. But supposedly, just, you know, allow them to engage in a little bit of special pleading and, you know, give them a lot of rope here. Supposedly, this is supposed to make everything okay. Somehow this preserves the doctrine of sinlessness. Adam, even though he sinned, even though it was a major sin, even though it was after his prophethood, Allah forgave him. Well, this, this creates a, a huge problem. And, and this is, uh, there's a there's a hadith that I really hope that people who engage Muslims will become familiar with, that they'll own this. It's a very important hadith. I, I might have mentioned it at least briefly last time, but it's known in or it's known in Islamic circles as the hadith of intercession. It's a mutawatir hadith, which means, it's a mass narrated hadith. So in the science of hadith criticism, hadith are evaluated for their strength and weakness. There are rejected hadith, which have no say in determining what is Islamic belief and practice and so forth. Uh, those are just simply dismissed altogether. But Outside of that, 
there are other hadiths that are graded from weak to strong or sound or, or sahih. So uh, sometimes Muslims will say that a weak, they'll act like a weak hadith is a unreliable, you know, you can't, it's, it can be dismissed, but that's not really what hadith scholars say. They just, they say that its strength is weak. It, it can't necessarily be rejected, but it has limited usefulness. Some will say that it can't be used to establish doctrine unless it's confirmed by other things, say a statement in the Quran or a statement in the Hadith, in which case, what do you need that weak Hadith for anyways? But uh, that's what some will say, or if there's other lines of reasoning that can go along with it, then that will help strengthen the Hadith. Uh, but they don't just reject it. They, they, they might give it a limited value in constructing doctrine or something like that, but it, it's still it's still in the realm of possibility, so they don't just say it's rejected. But up up uh, the the rung of authenticity are hadiths that are not only sound; they've been verified in terms of their reliability. The chain of transmission is sound. All these people are known. All these people had reliable memories and so forth. And they go back to the the prophet Muhammad. Not really a prophet, but I'm. I'm speaking in in their terminology here uh but but among those sound narration those that have the greatest weight are known as mutawat or hadith because they're not just sound in that they have a chain that is reliable but there's many different chains this person saying to this person saying to this person so many different reliable chains relate this and some of them give us additional detail some of us or some of them uh, leave out some some of the details but it's a very important narration so i'm going to go through this narration let me see how much time i have here to see how quickly i have to go through this all right so this this particular version there's there's many of them this one comes from sahih muslim book one number 30 or 378 so it's a long hadith but it, it, the whole thing is important. So it starts off saying, some cooked meat was brought to Allah's apostle and the meat of a forearm was presented to him as he used to like it. The Hadith material loved to tell us trivial details about things, including what Muhammad liked. He ate a morsel of it and said, notice this, so food is brought to Muhammad like he's a king. And then he says, I will be the chief of all the people on the day of resurrection. Do you know the reason for it? So this is critical. Some of the narrations of this leave this portion out. You can still catch the logic of what's going on in the Hadith from these other forms of the narration, but this one brings it to the fore. So the, the very impetus for the giving of this hadith of intercession stems from this muhammad's boast that he will be the chief of all the peoples on the day of resurrection now don't miss the blasphemy there as christians we recognize that the lord jesus christ is the one who condescended into the world took on our nature and by virtue of his atoning sacrifice and triumphant resurrection he was exalted to the right hand of the father Muhammad is claiming this for himself. Elsewhere in the Islamic sources, it talks about the uh, the praiseworthy station, uh, the exalted station. It's talking about this, this place that Muhammad is going to be exalted to over everybody next to Allah. And in this context, in this hadith, the idea that is being brought out that shows how Muhammad is chief is the fact that he's going to be given the right of intercession. Now, this is already interesting because uh, what I already said, that it, it shows that Muhammad's trying to usurp Jesus. He's trying to unseat Jesus and reign in his place at the right hand of God. But in the Islamic sources, it rejects the idea of the pagans, that they have these gods who are intercessors. And then what does it do? It sneaks in through the back door, the idea of an intercessor. This is the very thing the pagans were being criticized for, is thinking that they have these exalted beings who can intercede with God. 
for example, the daughters of Allah, Al-At, al and Manat, uh, when Muhammad gave his, uh, when he uttered the satanic verses, the famous satanic verses episode, what he said is he referred to the goddess daughters of Allah as the exalted or the high flying crane. And the idea was that in, in the pagan system, these, crane, these, these gods were called high flying cranes because they could ascend to Allah and intercede. Well, this is being condemned in the Quran as shirk. Well, here's Muhammad claiming for himself this prerogative. How is this not shirk in, on his part when it's shirk on their part? In any case, Muhammad's claiming he's going to be the chief, and he asks them, do you know the reason for it? Now listen to this. It says, Allah will gather all the human beings of early generations as well as late generations on one plane so that the announcer will be able to make them all hear his voice and the watcher will be able to see all of them. So everybody's going to be standing on an open plane. Other versions of this say they're going to be naked, which is interesting in light of other things. You know, the Quran, Muslims at least, accuse Christians, various things in the Bible, uh, of immodesty and, and so forth. Uh, women are supposed to, for example, wear a burqa to be modest. But here's Allah stripping everybody naked and having them all stand on a plane. Uh, apparently, Allah doesn't share Islamic scruples, or if he does, he changed his mind or he had a falling out with himself or he forgot something. They're all going to be standing there naked and he's going to cause the sun to come close so that the people will suffer such distress and trouble as they will not be able to bear or stand. So they're going to be baking in the hot desert sun. Then the people will say, don't you see to what state you have reached? Won't you look for someone who can intercede for you with your Lord? So while they're baking in the sun, waiting for the judgment, they're going to look around at each other and say, don't you see your miserable condition? You better seek out somebody to intercede for you. Some people will say to others, go to Adam. So they will go to Adam and say to him, you are the father of mankind. Allah created you with his own hand and breathed into you of his spirit and ordered the angels to prostrate before you. So intercede for us with your Lord. Don't you see in what state we are? Don't you see what condition we have reached? So these people, that's us, according to the Hadith, are going to be seeking out Adam to intercede with Allah because he was the first man, he was made with Allah's hand, the angels were commanded to prostrate to him, and so forth. How is Adam going to reply? Is he going to say, I can intercede because, after all, I am a prophet. I was the first of the prophets. I was a prophet to the entire human race. There were no divisions yet. Is, is he going to reply that way? Is he going to say, I can't intercede for you? What, what's Adam's response going to be? Notice this carefully because it, it actually unravels even what's going to follow in this hadith as well as this whole approach to the prophets as sinless. It says, Adam will say, Today my Lord has become angry as he has never been before, nor will ever be thereafter. He forbade me to eat of the fruit of the tree, but I disobeyed him, myself, myself, myself. So Adam's going to be worried about himself. I can't worry about you. I have no chance of interceding for you because I sinned and my Lord is so angry this day that I have to worry about myself. Now, think about this. Remember that the way they tried to rescue Adam, even though it doesn't really work as a rescue for you know, the, the claim that prophets are sinless, they said, well, Adam was forgiven of all his sins. And so supposedly we can say the prophets are sinless on this account. But notice what Adam is doing here on the day of judgment. He's been raised up and he's waiting for the judgment to commence. And he doesn't think he can intercede for people and is even worried about himself. Even though, according to the Islamic sources, Adam was forgiven. What kind of forgiveness is this? I mean, think this through. If Allah told Adam he was forgiven, 
And Adam on the day of judgment is terrified for his own soul, can't even worry about his descendants, but is frightened to the core of his being. I mean, this is emphatic. He says, myself, myself, myself. Three times he utters this. This is a way in the hadiths of emphasizing things. Adam is so worried about himself that he doesn't think he can intercede for anyone and doesn't even think that uh, he has any grounds for confidence with Allah. So apparently the forgiveness of Allah meant precious little. It meant precious little. Adam sinned and he's worried about Allah's judgment, which is so great that uh, there's nowhere for them to turn, at least not to him. So what Adam does is he turns them away from himself and points them to Noah. And then I'm not going to talk about what Noah says. Noah directs them to Abraham. Abraham directs them to Moses. Moses directs them to David. David directs them to Jesus. Jesus directs them to Muhammad. Now, so I'm glossing over some of these others. We're going to look at these in more detail on another occasion, but basically they all do the same thing. They all say, we can't intercede. We sinned myself, myself, myself. They're all terrified. None of them seem to have any peace with Allah, even though they were supposedly forgiven. But here's the interesting thing. So they go to Jesus eventually, and Jesus breaks the mold. Jesus breaks the mold here. They will go to Jesus and say, oh, Jesus, you're Allah's apostle and his word, which he sent to Mary. So this stands out as something distinctively true of Jesus. He is Allah's word. So when you hear Muslims say everyone's Allah's word, or it just means that he was created by Allah's word be, everything was created by his word be. Uh, that's how they try to get around this special title for Jesus. But the Hadith makes this a special title. It's not something true of everybody. Jesus is Allah's apostle and his word, which he sent to Mary, and a superior soul. And you talked to the people while still young in the cradle. People will inter uh, or please intercede for us with your Lord. Don't you see in what state we are? Jesus will say, note this, my Lord has become angry as he has never been before, nor will become hereafter. Jesus will not mention any sin. So according to this, the, the whole logic of this just breaks down here. All these people that are alleged to be sinless prophets by contemporary Muslims all confess sin and all turn people away from them, saying they're unworthy to intercede and are even worried about their selves, even though they were allegedly forgiven. All of them turn people away, saying they can't intercede because of their sin. When they go to Jesus, Jesus has no sin. He doesn't confess any sin. But he still turns them away to Muhammad. What happens when we go to Muhammad? Now, notice this. It says, go to someone else, go to Muhammad. So they will come to me, Muhammad says, and say, oh, Muhammad, you are Allah's apostle and the last of the prophets. And Allah forgave you all of your former and latter sins or all of your earlier and later sins. Please intercede for us with your Lord. So. If you're to talk to a Muslim, here's what they'll tell you. The reason Muhammad is able to intercede for people, the reason he's the greatest of the prophet is because Allah forgave him all his sins. Allah forgave him all his sins. Now, <laughs> there's, there's all sorts of problems here. Why is Muhammad able to intercede for people if Allah forgave him of all their sins, but Jesus isn't? Jesus had no sins. Surely, a person who didn't sin is greater than somebody who did sin. More than that, though, notice that Adam, too, was forgiven. So was Noah. So was Abraham. So was Moses. So was David. All these were forgiven. How is this grounds for Muhammad being greater than all these people, able to intercede and have the chief station, chief over everybody, that he's forgiven of his sins, his former and latter sins, when they were forgiven too. Moreover, remember how precious little this meant in the case of all these people. All these people were forgiven, but were terrified. 
So how does saying Muhammad was forgiven of his former and latter sins proof that Muhammad is fit for this undertaking? But but notice this. This, this is uh, critically important as well. It says that Allah forgave Muhammad of his former and later sins. So the sins that he committed prior to becoming a prophet and the sins that he uh, committed subsequent to becoming a prophet. This is also narrated in uh, other places. It's it's mentioned in uh, the Quran. There are numerous passages in the Quran that talk about Muhammad's sin, uh, not only prior to his prophethood, but afterwards. So, for example, uh, Surah 40, 55, it says, uh, Then have patience, O Muhammad, lo, the promise of Allah is true. Ask forgiveness of your sin and him the praise of your Lord at fall of night and in the early hours. So here's Muhammad even as a prophet being told to ask for forgiveness. In Surah 47, Allah, uh, er, Muhammad is told to ask for forgiveness. Surah 48, uh, it says, uh, Lo, we have given thee a signal victory, that is in this battle, that Allah may forgive thee of thy sin, that which is past and that which is to come. So notice, Muhammad committed sins before he became a prophet and after he became a prophet, according to these sources. So the whole impetus driving the claim that the prophets are sinless so that contemporary Muslims can argue against the authenticity of the Bible just falls flat to the ground. The Bible doesn't teach that the prophets are sinless. The Quran doesn't teach that the prophets are sinless. The Hadith doesn't teach that the prophets are sinless. But there is one thing that they all do teach, that Jesus was sinless. Neither do they teach that the prophets only committed sins prior to their prophethood or only committed minor sins. They teach that they committed enormities great enormities. In fact, I'm going to look at other prophets subsequent to this. We're going to uh, answer some questions now, but uh, we're going to see all kinds of heinous sins being committed by those reputed to be prophets. And Muhammad is not the least of them. He's the greatest. he's, He's a person who commits more sins, according to the Islamic sources, than any of the prophets combined. Okay, when we look at the Islamic sources, he commits more sins than any of the prophets combined. But I'll conclude with that for today, and we'll answer some questions, and we'll pick it up again next time. That's amazing, Anthony. I just, I don't know how much time it takes you to put together this, you know, nice sound argument based on their sources, but it, it's just, uh, I, I applaud you for all that you put into this. This is great. Yeah, if you missed it, uh, you can go back and watch later, but at least you can pick up on the questions now. So let's see what we have. So one thing is, uh, Brian Reeder says, how's Anthony typing while his hands are moving around? So because we're broadcasting on my channel and on the Ministry to Muslims channel, George Saig has, uh, when he types on his end, it comes out on Ministry to Muslims as, as what he's saying, and it comes out on my channel as what I'm saying. So that's not me typing. Oh, it's George, and you're muted. You're muted, George. It's me, I said. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't see any questions. Uh, if you guys can repost it, if you... Okay, I see one question here, okay. And there's one below that one, too. Okay. Yeah, so I'll get more into this down the line. I don't know how long it's going to take before we look in detail at Muhammad. I, I brought him in here just just to make this point about Adam and, and, and provide a, a foil for it. But the, the Islamic sources don't say mistakes that uses the words for sin in the case of muhammad and it, what's interesting is when you look at the different words that are used they're used in in other places clearly to refer to something greater than simple mistakes moreover when you look at specific things that muhammad did even apart from any evaluation that's given of them whether it calls them a sin or anything else Elsewhere, when the Quran enumerates sins, it, it mentions these sorts of things, right? So th- there are all sorts of things that Muhammad did that the Quran flat out condemns. Uh, well, I- in the case of Muhammad, it tries to skate around them in, in many cases, but uh, 
when it's talking about other people doing them, it, it, it treats these as very serious. Right. Okay. Obviously, what Adam did eating of the fruit <clears throat> was serious enough to get kicked out of paradise. That, that's essentially theft. Well, did Muhammad steal anything? Well, yes, he did. Right? And we'll get into some of that. That's just one example. Okay, another question. All right, so <laughs> there's a couple of Quranic verses say shirk is unforgivable, yet another surah says has um, Abraham committing shirk three times in a 24-hour period. Yeah, so that would be an example of a prophet in Islam committing sin. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is it's clearly a major sin because it's shirk. There is no more major sin. As he points out, it's unforgivable. So Abraham as a prophet sinned and he committed major sins and he, he did it more than once. So apparently he's got a habit of it. If he did it three times in a 24 hour period, I wonder how many times he did it in his entire life. The Quran doesn't give us his entire life. The, the Islamic Abraham. Uh, yeah, so that's that's a huge problem. Different Muslims... And, and would that have been before his prophethood or after? Being... Well, yeah, the, the uh, I'm sure they, you know, there's probably Muslims who would say before, but that's not true, right? I'll do the same thing with Abraham down the line and show the commencement of his prophethood and when all these sins that are recorded actually happen in his life, they come afterward. But uh, I was just going to say about unfor the unforgivable sin of shirk that Muslims have various ways they try to deal with that because clearly there are people that committed the unforgivable sin and they don't want to say, I mean, the, the problem here is why do they invite pagans to Islam? That they're supposedly inviting them because they can be forgiven and go to Jannah. But if shirk is unforgivable and these pagans that are being invited committed shirk, then there's no point in inviting them. So Muslims have to deal with that. And so some will say that that was abrogated, but that's fundamentally, I mean, how does that work, right? Because uh, think about it. That means that at one point this was enforced, that shirk is unforgivable. So does that mean that all the people who died before it was rescinded will be held accountable to that? Or does that mean that people that, does he, did Allah abrogate it for all time? Because people are going to arrive at the judgment after it has been abrogated, in which case they might have committed shirk during their lifetime. But since it was abrogated before the final judgment, it's no longer accounting against them. Uh, you know, so, I mean, there, to me, there's just problems upon problems that result from this sort of thing. Uh, but Muslims have to find a way to get out of them. So I, I think this is a huge problem. All right. Petrus asks, not related to the topic, but does anyone remember the Quran Hadith verse regarding how women should wear the hijab so Muslim men know they are off limits when in foreign lands? Uh, I can't think of that one offhand. Uh, my thought initially is sort of four, but I could be wrong. Okay. I think uh, that's uh, all the questions, unless if uh, a new question came. Okay, yeah, new question. Regarding the resurrection, I don't understand why. The, so this is also off topic, maybe, huh? I don't understand why the resurrection of Jesus means that God accepted the offering. I've heard that that said, but I don't understand the logic biblically. Yeah, so the, the basic logic is this. Death is the result of sin. So when a person sins, they're guilty, and guilt makes one liable to punishment. So when a person commits a crime, the law justly, exacts a crime or a, a, um, a penalty from them. When a person is pardoned, then they're free from liability and they're free from the, the punishment. So the punishment is what? The punishment is death. 
if Jesus rose from the dead, then it shows that the penalty was paid. It was removed. There's no longer any penalty in force against uh, him. And now somebody might say, well, what about resurrections prior to Jesus? Well, the whole point is, I mean, these aren't the final resurrections. These are uh, resuscitations, if you will, anticipating the final resurrection, showing that Jesus has the power to raise the dead. But they're also a uh, forced taste of, or they're, they're evidences that G in Jesus, s the curse of sin is removed. And so death is... Uh, can be uh, vanquished, right? So uh, in, in the case of Christ, we know that his resurrection was not just a temporary resuscitation. It was a permanent rising from the dead. So Acts 16 says that it, uh, you will not let your Holy One suffer corruption in the grave, right? So the, the idea is because he's holy, he can't remain under corruption. And so, I mean, this is part of the case. There's a lot more that goes into this, but it's it's involved in this. If Jesus paid the penalty for sin, then he can't be re, he can't remain subject to death because death is the penalty for sin, right? So, if if he paid the penalty, then death is removed. Was that clear, Eric? <laughs> I think so. And sorry, man. Well, I guess that was relevant enough uh, to the topic. All right, William uh, asks, since Muslims consider Muhammad a prophet, what prophecies do they believe he got right? Yeah, so some Muslims will claim that Muhammad predicted tall buildings, for example, that they would be constructed by Bedouins. Uh, there's, there's hadith that talk about this sort of thing. W one problem with a lot of this is a lot of this material that they try to go to is later. So it's it's like the accounts of Muhammad's miracles. These don't come in the early sources. You don't find them in the Quran. You find them much later. It's all embellishment. But even still, the even if you take these things at face value, like Muhammad saying that uh, Bedouins are going to be competing with each other to build tall buildings, what they point to is, you know, you look over there in... Uh, Dubai, right, or Saudi Arabia, and you see these big, tall buildings, and this is supposed to be proof. Look, here's these Saudi Arabians building these tall buildings, and they're even vying with one another to build taller buildings. Building a building that rises higher than others is supposed to be a sign of superiority. That's why in Islamic countries, under Islamic rule, uh, churches couldn't have steeples higher than uh, Islamic buildings, right? So they were constantly building higher buildings. Well, the problem is, this is anachronistic. It's the idea of taller buildings is relative, right? If in my in my neighborhood there are houses that are taller than mine, right? There are two story houses. We live in a one story house. Uh, that's is that what Muhammad was talking about, or is he talking about skyscrapers? The they're reading this twentieth century phenomena or twenty first century phenomena. <laughs> back into this and pretending that these are the tall buildings that Muhammad was talking about. But all it has to be talking about is building. You can go back to the seventh century, the eighth century, the ninth century, Muslims are building tall buildings and, and, and uh, you know, people were all over the world. You know, so there, there's not much of a prediction there is what I'm getting at. You, you know, it's, it's relative to a time period. One building taller than another could just be, you know, a building that's 50 feet rather than 40 feet doesn't have to mean skyscrapers and and who's going to be impressed with that that somebody says hey somebody's going to build 50 foot buildings rather than 40 foot yeah so th there's not a lot of teeth to these claims it's not like the prophecies of the bible from beginning to end where you have explicit predictions about jesus where he'll be born what sorts of things will be happening during his lifetime what he will do how he will die, what he'll accomplish, and not just explicit prophecies, but types. All the history of the Old Testament is leading up to Jesus. The sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham, Joseph being betrayed by his brothers and exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh. Uh, all, all these stories, and one story after another, all this converging on Jesus is, is astounding. There's nothing astounding in the claims of 
Muslims that Muhammad prophesied anything? He did prophesy the saying about the Romans win against the Persians or something. He he knows that they are always engaged in wars, and he said in few years, and it happened after nine years or something like that. Yeah, yeah, he said a few years, and the fact is that it wasn't after a few years. The Islamic sources actually tell us how many years a few years is, and the reversal didn't take place until after the time period that Muhammad had set. And so the background to this that you were alluding to is that the Romans and the Persians were constantly going back and forth. At one time, one group would have the ascendancy. At another time, the other group would. So it was kind of this back and forth thing. So when Muhammad says the Romans are going to have the ascendancy, he's just looking at the track record. We can all do that. If, if we, we watch the tables turning constantly in some scenario, who's going to be impressed if we say, oh, it's going to turn back again the other direction? It's kind of like, the weather. Uh, sometimes we have cold winters or sometimes in my area we have snowy winters. Sometimes we don't. And what's, what's going to be remarkable if anybody says, Hey, you know, it didn't snow this year, but in the next couple of years, eventually it will or something, you know, there's just, that's not impressive. That's just following a pattern. Yeah. There's and a Muhammad was wrong and he was wrong because he said a few years and it didn't happen that way. Yeah. Uh, and there was a funny one also. He said, uh, uh, the, one of his wives was the largest hand. She gonna die first. The wife was the largest hand gonna die first. Mm -hmm. When she died, they measured their hands. It was not the largest hand. Then what they they came with a different interpretation for that. She is the most giving person. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they help him out a little bit. Um, okay, there is another question here. I thought Islam says Jannah is only after the resurrection of the day of judgment at the last hour. Well, don't expect the sources to be consistent. Uh, in the, I didn't go over it, but in the different accounts of Adam's fall, there are statements that appear to have Adam on earth and going up and then coming back down. And then there are other statements that have it differently. It, it's not very consistent. So Adam starts off on earth, which by the way, all the accounts presuppose that even, even the ones that have him starting off in heaven, because they talk about him being made from the dirt, the ground. If you look at various Hadiths, it talks about Adam being stood upright as a, as a lifeless statue. This is all taking place on earth. And then it talks about Allah putting him in the garden. So he goes up and down and, and, there's not always uniformity here. So uh, yeah, my, my first thought would just be, you don't have to have consistency if we're, if you're talking about the Islamic sources, but maybe a Muslim will want to say this all happens after the resurrection. Uh, that's fine. Uh, it, it doesn't negate the point that I was making about uh, the idea that Muhammad was, a, or Adam was a prophet before he sinned. And, you know, you have Adam and Moses arguing whenever that takes place. It's certainly after their lifetime. Right. The, uh, Adam is referring back to what happened in the case of Moses. He's referring to Allah giving him his book, the Torah, and, and Moses is referring back to Adam sinning. So it's certainly subsequent to all of that. OK, I think this is the last question here. Ross asks, a Muslim friend told me that Christianity is false because Apostle Paul distorted the original true faith and that Christianity and the worship of Jesus was a false command. Is this true? Now, this is, first of all, this is an assertion. And anytime somebody makes an assertion, the proper response that you should give is prove it. Okay. Don't just, you know, be, uh, to me, the too many people are bowled over by somebody asserting something and perhaps even insisting on it. This is just a propaganda technique. Muslims repeatedly do this sort of thing. They think they're arguing when all they're doing is asserting. But one assertion plus another assertion plus another assertion never mounts up to an argument. Okay, they, they all have the value of zero. Now, what usually happens when a Muslim does try to give evidence for this is they'll say something like, Paul contradicted the message of the other apostles, so he can't be trusted. Well, again, where's the proof of that? Where's the proof that he contradicted the other apostles? Give me an example of something he contradicted them on. Now, it's not that they won't ever 
try and come up with something, but here's where you need to know your Bible and know how to show that's not really a contradiction. So some of them might say, well, the Apostle Paul introduced into Christianity the idea that Jesus is God. Really? Uh, I can point you to the Gospel of Mark, which is on liberal accounts, so not even conservative Christian ones, it's the earliest gospel, and yet the opening three verses call Jesus the Lord. It's quoting the Old Testament, calling Jesus the Lord. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for Lord is Jehovah, the name of God. So right out of the chute, Mark calls Jesus God. The, the same thing is true for all the gospels. The same thing is true for all the apostles. All the New Testament writings in one way or another identify Jesus as God. So Paul didn't introduce that into Christianity. Uh, some might say that Paul introduced the idea that we, through Christ, have forgiveness on account of his sacrifice, that his sacrifice is sufficient to remove our guilt and make us acceptable before God. But isn't that the point of all the Gospels? The A, a lot of people, when they describe what the Gospels are all about, so, they'll say things like, the Gospels are passion narratives with lengthy introductions. The idea is all four Gospels are leading up to the passion, the, the crucifixion of Christ. And they're, they're, they're basically saying a lot to lead us up to that point, but that's the main thing that they're trying to get us to. Why is that the main thing of all these accounts that Jesus died? Why are they all focused on this event? Is it to no end? Is it just because he's a martyr? That, that doesn't seem to hold together. And if you're reading the Gospels carefully, you know from the lips of Jesus himself why he's going to die. He's going to die for sin. If you look at Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark 10, Jesus several times over in those chapters says he's going to die for sin. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus in the Gospels claims that he was giving his life as a ransom. So Paul didn't invent that. So what is it that Paul introduced into Christianity? Well, they'll say, well, Paul said that uh, you don't have to follow certain commandments given in the Mosaic administration, the Mosaic covenant, such as sacrifices, circumcision, these sorts of things. Well, when we look at the Gospels, first of all, that's part of the point of, of what, what Jesus is doing when he's dying is he's fulfilling all those symbols, all those ceremonies. The, the whole point of those ceremonies, the sacrifices, the priest of the temple was all pointing to Jesus as the true sacrifice. And so even if prior to the crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus didn't tell them to stop doing all these things, certainly this climactic event reorients things. Jesus even said in John 4, for example, to the woman at, at the well in Samaria, he tells her, because she said to him, hey, our forefathers say we're supposed to worship at this mountain, the, the temple that's here in, in, on Mount Gerizim. Your forefathers say that we are to do it in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, the true place is in Jerusalem. That's what God revealed through the prophets. He says, but woman, this is my paraphrase, the time is coming and now is when those who worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. What he's telling her is that by virtue of his coming, something radically new is happening that will reorient everything. It'll no longer be important whether you face the temple in Jerusalem or not, because that's just a type and a shadow. It's not the truth. It's not the reality. It's pointing to the reality. I'm the reality. In me, all these things have their fulfillment. Now that I have come, once I have uh, accomplished the work, once it is finished, all that's going to pass away and everything's going to be directed towards me as their focal point, their, their culmination, their fulfillment. And so even Jesus and the Gospels are teaching the same thing that Paul did. So Muslims try to undermine Paul as the one who supposedly changed everything, but it's the same stuff that we find in all the gospels, all the epistles, and it's already predicted in the Old Testament. Even if we didn't have the gospels and the epistles, we already have it in the Old Testament. When the early apostles were preaching, they were preaching even before the New Testament was written, and what were they preaching? They were preaching in Jesus, the fulfillment of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was the scriptural foundation for what they were saying. So, this is all there in the Old Testament, according to their own testimony. Now, another problem for Muslims is attacking Paul as the, the scapegoat, making him the guy to pin everything on, is a very late thing. It wasn't early 
uh, Muslims who were doing this sort of thing. There's stuff in the Islamic sources that refer to Paul positively. In the Islamic sources, he's called Bulus, because in uh, in Greek he's you know Paulus and so forth. Uh, so when he's referred to in the Islamic sources, he's referred to as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus. He's not dismissed as a fraud and a fake and all that. It was liberal scholarship in the 1900s that began to attack Paul. And Muslims, since they are, are very rarely capable of generating their own arguments, they always leech off of liberals and others. So they, they picked this up like crumbs off a table from liberals and started using it. It wasn't what early Muslims were saying. So a lot more could be said about Paul, uh, but next time a Muslim says something to you, you tell him what I said. No. I, I had a question texted to me uh, that someone is not in the chat. She wants to know about Eve and her role in the fall. And is she even mentioned in the Muslim sources? And what do you know about that? So it doesn't say a lot about Eve. Uh, she gets short shrift. Uh, it does talk about Adam and Eve being kicked down to earth. And uh, where are the two locations? Do you remember, George? Um, you're muted, but one. One in India and one in Saudi Arabia. And they recognize each other from far away from the two countries. And that's why one of them was in the mountain of Arafat. It means the one. The word Arafat, it means recognize. They call the mountain recognize because he recognized his wife or she recognized her husband across countries, which <laughs> yeah. I don't well, know. <laughs> part of what would be behind this is the idea that both of them were very tall. But even at that, they weren't, e even if you have Adam as 60 feet tall or 90 cubits, uh, that's still not tall enough to see each other, I would not think. I don't know. I, I don't. He, he actually took the statue that uh, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, I don't oh, know Nebuchadnezzar? Okay. Yeah, about the statue. He made Adam the same uh, height okay. as that statue. Uh, but I, we have one more question here, uh, I think, Karen. And that's, that's going to be the last question. I have no opinion. I've never watched it. Um... Yeah, I just I didn't watch it. Uh, I've, the yeah, only thing just, I've, I've heard that it's Mormon made, so that already. Uh, I, I think it, it, he partnered with the Mormons to use oh. their facilities, but it's still. Oh. I watched season one; it was okay, but the season two, from the first episode, I stopped it immediately when I saw John debating with Mary what he should write in the Gospel of John. This is absolutely not acceptable. Mm. It's not John and Mary opinions what is in the Gospel. It is absolutely inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, the Holy Spirit will remind you of all these things. Mm. Uh, it's not Mary's opinion being put into the Gospel. I, I would not watch that anymore. Yeah. Now, now, personally, I'll just tell you, I'm averse to all representation of Jesus. Because in part, there's there's more to this, but in part, it's I whenever you see an actor portraying Jesus, first of all, it's just I've seen actors that to me struck me as effeminate actors that, you know, they're just different. Even if they're acting, they're some, you know, they're 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 trying to bring out of the resources they have uh, some way of portraying or representing Jesus. And to me, it's just, it, it's, it's anything that doesn't r accurately represent him that falls short, I just don't like, right? So in the Bible, we have a very clear picture that nobody can fault. There, there's no shortcomings here, right? And, and I just never liked a lot of these portrayals of Jesus, you know, because uh, no matter how good an actor is, he's, he's going to fall short that, that's the least of my objections but it's it's definitely yeah, and, and problematic case, for me. Also, the, the actor is a catholic and in his own time he doing all this catholic thing and if he consider he also almost like being endorsed by him them using him in the chosen uh he being like almost like endorsing the catholic church and as a result he has so many followers in uh, his social media and praying to mary and all these things that we absolutely don't agree with. Hmm. Um, but anyway, um, 
before I, we... I just, oh, go ahead. So, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, sir. You have a question? Go ahead, brother. No, I was just going to say, you know, I wish, <laughs> you know, The Chosen is so popular. I wish the Bible was as popular mm. as far as reading goes as yeah. people wanting to watch this series. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very sad. Um, but anyway, um, Anthony, thank you so much, brother. And uh, But uh, you're going to be with us at our Strong Tower on in both East and West Coast. Uh, if uh, From the East to the West. East Coast, uh, May 31st and June 1st. And we're going to have uh, Samuel Green coming all the way from Australia. We're having uh, Laura Powell. Uh, Anthony, uh, Eddie Del Cor will be here in person. Uh, Apologist Olin. And also Dr. Tony will be joining online during that time. Uh, we also having a special event for the youth. Uh, we're going to have uh, some kind of uh, 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 power team uh, moves and stuff to attract the young people, but also we're going to equip them in uh, how to defend the Christian faith. Uh, the other one is our Strong Tower uh, West Coast. This is the 23rd year, uh, September 13th to the 15th. Uh, I think this is need to be updated. There's one more person, but uh, this is special guest. I cannot tell you who he is. That's a surprise. Uh, but uh, Anthony is there, uh, Dr. J., Al Fadi coming in person, Kamal Fahmi. Uh, I know him for over 40 years. Uh, wonderful brother. Uh, he's coming all the way from Europe. And uh, we have a brother also coming from Africa, from Nigeria. Uh, it's a, from Season uh, Apologetics. He would be there. That Dr. Dembo. Oh, right is it Corday? Yeah, he's going to be there in person as well. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yep, yep. Uh, we, we, we have amazing lineup of uh, topics and speakers. Uh, uh, the focus the focus topic is uh, last year was uh, dismantling the Quran. This year is contrasting Jesus and Muhammad. I'm sorry, we're choosing words that I have a hard time saying. Mm -hmm. uh, person teaching and influence for today. It's going to be really awesome. We're going after Muhammad. Uh, we're defending our Lord and Savior in many different areas. Uh, it's going to be a really, really great topic. It's going to, I, I really believe uh, um, the, the place is going to be filled very soon. It's not a big uh, venue. Uh, I, I re really encourage you uh, to get your tickets early enough for this one. Um, now, We're having a debate next Saturday, and we have hey. all in result. <laughs> yes. The whole crew. Uh, <laughs> why, why we debate, uh, Anthony? Why debates why? are important? Oh, why do we debate? Well, it's, it's one way of evangelizing. In, in my view, mm -hmm. one reason I've done it, and I think this is true for other apologists, there's obviously some desire for the person we're debating to come to faith, but even if that person's got their heels dug in, they're hard-hearted and whatever, there's people listening. And because there are representatives of the other side, that will often bring advocates of that side or adherence to it. So they're going to hear that. So they may not, you know, somebody may not listen to me or Olin or any of us in this format because mm -hmm. they don't want to be challenged without hearing how their side would respond to it. But when their side is involved, they might listen to that. So it opens the door for people to hear things. Uh, but another thing I often think about is the fact that when we engage them, it slows down their momentum. So a lot of people are very gung-ho about doing things until they receive opposition. If we don't give them any opposition, they'll keep going, right? And we've seen, what do we see historically with respect to these Islamic apologists? How many Islamic apologists that were around debating 30 years ago are still around? They're not, are they? Right? 20 years ago. Maybe one here, one there. But for the va uh, vast majority of them, they fall out of uh, debating. But the Christian debaters, how many of those are still around? If they're alive, they're probably still engaging in apologetics. Right? David's been around for decades. I've been around for decades. Uh, you know, all sorts of people that have been debating uh, on the Christian side are still here. So 
I think it makes them a little gun shy. It, it slows them down. Uh, but then the third thing is it glorifies God. E even if, you know, when I look at the Gospels, it's, it's always interesting. It'll, it'll give a series of things that Jesus said and did. Or even in the book of Acts, it'll talk about what the apostles did. And it'll conclude with a kind of summary statement. It'll say some believed, some didn't, others wanted to hear more. <laughs> yeah, so there's always this mixed response. And we, we don't need to expect everybody to come to faith through what we do, uh, because that's not even what happened in the case of Jesus or the apostles. Not everybody came to faith. There are some occasions when nobody came to faith through the witness of Christ. Uh, you know, especially in his hometown, people just turned to, you know, deaf ear to. So, but Jesus didn't shrink back from doing it just because these, you know, in some places, even nobody was going to listen. He, but he knew it glorified God. It was promoting the truth. So those are some of my thoughts on, on it. Uh, Eric, you watch many debates? I know you moderated debate before, right? Or no? I, I love watching debates, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. I'm wondering who, uh, who chose the topic, Olin? Well, we hashed it out over several weeks. We changed it a couple of times, and this is where we ended up. Um, I think it was mostly me. He was he was he was wanting to go with uh, can Muslims prove Jesus is not God, and uh, I wanted to focus on both the divine nature and his human nature. Yeah, so, but but also yes, Muslim can prove Jesus is not God from the Quran. Right. I, I don't know what material he's going to use. Right. <laughs> uh, we have to be clear about what we're debating here. Uh, uh, what, what would you debate, uh, Anthony? Or would you debate kind of Muslim proof Jesus is not God? That that's the full question. Can a Muslim prove that Jesus is not God? That, that's what Nadir Ahmed he originally wanted to debate. We and what is it now? Is Jesus the God Man? Mm. Yeah. So I mean, obviously some standards going to have to be determined. And so in this case, Olin will be arguing that the Bible is the only infallible or reliable criteria and historically reliable criteria. Uh, and maybe if he wants to use the Quran, he can say even from your standpoint of what's authoritative, uh, Jesus is God. But I think what Nadir is going to do, I think we talked about this, what he's going to do, because Nadir, Nadir is a broken record. He's got a couple of issues that are his hobby horse. Uh, we uh, need to make sure we don't uh, talk about this topic. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, well, I, I could hold off. but uh, Maybe he's I already, watching right now. <laughs> I, I, will, I don't think he knows that Olin's going to be on here because this is the tail end of my time. But um, he's stuck on the issue of science in the Quran. He thinks that the Quran has wonderful insights into science. And so even when the debate is not about science, he makes it about science. So he's going to say Jesus is not really a prophet because he made scientifically inaccurate statements, right? That's, you know, and then you fill in the blank. He's going to say Jesus said that the uh, mustard seed is the smallest of all garden seeds, but it's not. You know, but obviously he's speaking within a context. He's speaking to Jews in that context. You know, that would be true. But anyways, I, I just know ahead of time that's that's Nadir. He, he can't think beyond a couple of issues. Uh, Olin, I, I don't want you to go in details what you're going to talk about. But uh, I, I this is your first debate with a Muslim, right? That's right. I, um, I <laughs> spent the uh, last 12 to 15 years of my life studying Islam and I've had several formal debates with it. I've had one with an atheist. I've had one with a deist. Uh, but this is my first one with a Muslim. And, you know, it, it's interesting. I constantly have heard that Muslims want to have dialogue and they want to talk. And, and yet I've, I've found it to be very difficult. And, and so, you know, with that in mind, I, I'm grateful for Nadir and his willingness to come and debate me. But I, you know, we've we've talked several times the last uh, couple of three weeks or so, and you know, I've just really challenged him to to stay on topic, 
and to respond to evidence with counter evidence. So, you know, I've, I've, I've really been challenging him to, you know, not go off on these tangents and not, you know, we, we talked about no personal attacks. That, that's not me. Uh, I mean, of course, I could, <laughs> I guess I could, you know, uh, lose it like anybody could, but I don't, I really don't see that coming. I, I, I wish nothing but the best for Nadir, and I would love to see him come to saving faith in the Amen. Lord Jesus Christ. And and so that's that's my goal. Um, Amen. Yeah. Uh, I remember when uh, President George Bush, W. Bush, uh, he said Islam is a religion of peace and hijackers hijacked a great religion in 2004. Uh, I sent a letter to every single mosque in America challenging them to debate is Islam a religion of peace. After three years of uh, death threats and harassments, uh, finally, one person accepted our challenge, which was mm -hmm. Nadir Ahmed. He sent me a letter with a challenge uh, that is showing that he accepted the challenge to debate that topic. Um, ser seriously, I, I understand uh, uh, his frustration sometimes listening to him, but in the end, he is willing to stand and defend yeah. Islam. And you know what? I cannot blame him. Uh, if if he doesn't make sense, you know why? Because the Quran doesn't make sense. The Hadith doesn't make sense. If he come to know Christ as the Lord and Savior, he would make all the sense. Uh, we just need the left. Uh, I want to ask every one of you, please pray for the salvation of uh, Nadir, that he may come to know Christ as he preparing for this debate. Uh, left our brother Olin in your prayer as well, that God will anoint him and use him uh, for many people to hear the gospel message. And uh, thank you so much, guys. And next next week, uh, Saturday at what, 4 p.m.? 4 p.m. Eastern. 4 p.m. Eastern time. And we're going to be live in, uh, I was going to say Hatun channel. Uh, no, it's in Olin's channel, in M2M channel. And also Carm's channel. Wait, tell um, them tell them what Owen's channel is. Uh, Live Christianity. I can I can post it right now. Uh, let's see, I can post it if I can. <laughs> uh, brother, can you put it on the on the chat or is I? No, I mean I'm talking to Owen. It's uh, Why Christianity 8388. Uh, YouTube came up with those <laughs> numbers. numbers. Yeah, so if you just search Why Christianity, you're, you may not find I will. I'm going to post it right now. There. I just uh, posted okay. it. It's there. <clears throat> okay. Oh, you did it before me again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, please uh, uh, left uh, our brother in prayer and join us this coming Saturday. Uh, there's a possibility Carm will be moderating. Uh, if not, me or uh, brother Eric, one of us, <laughs> will jump in and uh, and uh, moderate the debate. Um, it's going to be a really awesome time to see uh, our Lord uh, being defended and uh, um any other, any false teaching about Jesus will be exposed. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much for being with us. You are always a blessing. Thank yeah. you, Eric. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, Olin. And we see you guys, uh, Lord willing, Saturday. If not, we're going to be on Sunday uh, with uh, Reverend Samuel Green next uh, mm -hmm. Sunday. Samuel Green will be with us. I think he continue on chapter 9 of the Quran. In M to M channel uh, will be live. Uh, now, until that time, God bless you guys, and see you next week. <laughs>